Do that again. Good morning. morning. So glad you are here. It's good to be back. Susan and I had a great trip. Um, The flights were okay. We got delayed on the way out, and they were going to put us in at 4 a.m. instead of 2 a.m. or 1 a.m. And so we got rerouted, and we got in at 2 a.m. But it's all good, because that was only 11 o'clock here. So we... we, uh, the wedding was beautiful. We spent um, last Sunday at two of our supporting churches, uh, one of which is the church that Susan's dad was a part of from his teenage years. And the lady at the piano, who is 91 years old, playing contemporary cor- um, hymns and choruses, grew up with her dad and great memories and so forth. So uh, that was a lot of fun lot of fun to be with her and with the the folks at those two churches so thank you for for plugging on without me i heard mike did a great job and if you don't know the history between mike bialia and myself we served at camp together co-counselors in a cabin and god just knit our hearts together and we i we get give each other big hugs every time we see each other because of that um and uh, i just we um, have a real real special love for that guy so I'm so thankful he was able to be here. Uh, and um, we're going to be gone again the Sunday after VBS. Uh, we will be in Phoenix, Arizona at one of our BCP church plants there, Wayne and Shauna Dale, which some of you will remember the Dales. Uh, I will be speaking at their church. And we have a very special guest speaker for that Sunday. And he's sitting in the back row. Jacob is going to bring the message that week. So we want you to be here, be supportive, be a very friendly audience for him. Uh, give him a lot of amens. Um, so no tomato. No tomato but, <laughs> only if they've been made into sauce and put on pizza for afterwards. Okay. You can deal with him yourself, Jacob. <laughs> It is so good to be able to worship together. I invite you to stand and sing with us. Oh, for a thousand tongues to sing my great Redeemer's praise. Oh, for a thousand tongues to sing my great Redeemer's praise. Love there is a Lord, my God, thousand tongues and we have ten thousand reasons to sing his praise.
BBS starts a Yay. month from tomorrow. Yay! We will be ready. Absolutely. We're going to talk a little bit more about that after we sing a song, but we want to, you to start getting familiar with some of the VBS songs. And so this is the one, this is the one we're going to pr probably be our kind of our theme song. It's the one we're doing in the parade. It's the one we're doing in the parade, which is 4th of July, 10 a.m. We need people to walk and pass out candy and uh, not candy otter pops. otter pops frozen otter pops we need as many walkers yes you may <laughs> yes you may we would love you. <laughs> please yeah yeah <laughs> yes we would love to have any and all of you to to help us we will be freezing about 2,000 otter pops um and that may not be enough if it's a nice day so um please let us know. We need to know you're coming because we need, we need to make plans for all this. So let us know um, so that we can check you off the list uh, so we know who's going to be there. So um, I'm going to let you stay seated. Samantha is going to do the signs. Uh, we're not signing. It's not going to be every word signed, but we are going to learn the sign language that will go along with this song. Okay? All right, you ready? Turn it up just a little bit. Take up the word of God. Take up your sword. Trust in the word of God. Victory is sure. No matter the trials or battles you face. Take up the word of God. Take up your sword. Focus on taking the word of God is powerful. Trust in the word. Take up your soul. The word of God is powerful. Trust in the Lord. Take up your soul. I'll get it. Bury the word of God deep in your heart. All the words of God, every part. Out in your brain, and never rise. Bury the word of God deep in your heart. The word of God is powerful. Trust in the Lord, take up your sword. The word of 
our God is powerful. Trust in the Lord, take up your sword. The word of God is powerful. Trust in the Lord, take up your sword. The word of God is powerful. Trust in the Lord, take up your sword. Take up the word of God, take up your sword. Take up the word of God, take up your sword. So it's you that simple. Isn't that a nice song? I love that. So you focus all did well. on take up the word of God, take up your sword. If you can learn that much, everyone, we're going to be very, very happy. So Samantha, show everyone. Take up, take up the word of God. Let's do that again. Take up, take up the word. Two fingers on this hand, one finger. Word. word. Yep. Right hand has two fingers, left hand has one. So, word of God. Take up your sword. Literally, that's almost the whole song. If we can all do that together, you can it's do that be much. Amazing. The other one, the other verses. Yeah, one more yeah, time. Yeah. Take up the word of God. of God. Take up your sword. Yeah, you did it. Woo! Very nice. Um, we do have some important dates to remember. We've been planning. And we've gotten a lot done on Wednesday nights in our planning. Now it is time to really nail things down. So training, if you're intending to help with Vacation Bible School, if you can at all be there Wednesday night, 614 and 621, I'm going to go through um, what you need to know about the schedule, what you need to know about your roles, and um, our basic child abuse prevention policies. We want to make sure that everyone is trained in that, that we're all on the same page, we're all handling the children the same way, everything we're doing is legal, fits within our insurance mandates, and that parents can feel safe bringing their children here. So we will be training in that. If you cannot be there those times and you're planning to be VBS, working at VBS, I will need to train you another time because that is a requirement. So the easiest thing, if you can be at one of those two nights, that's the easiest. If not, you can still help. I will still want you to help. Just see me so that I can go over those policies with you. And then after that, um, on June 28th and July 6th, we'll be decorating this building. The 28th. The 28th, we will not be here. Correct. There will still be yes. people. Yes, yes. We'll there also be working there. on building the float. There'll probably be more times in addition to that. But the parade is July 4th at 10 a.m. downtown. And like... PT said we really need all hands on deck for that because it will be a big crowd of people and we'll have a lot of Otter Pops to hand out. The float is going to be a castle with a dragon coming out of it that's going to be on um, Keith's trailer. And then those of us who are walking have two options. If you are one of those fun people who loves costumes, Medieval costumes would be wonderful. We are getting some from another church, or if you have something you want to wear, yeah, I mean, really, seriously, this is an opportunity to go all out. <laughs> if you are the person who says, don't you dare put me in a costume, I still want you to help, please just wear your crossroad shirt. That way we'll know that what group you're, you're with. Um, but costuming is highly encouraged if you enjoy such things. Some so. of you look more medieval than others anyway. But uh. <laughs> I have a little wish list here. I'm also going to put it in the um, group me because here's what I found. Oftentimes when I go to buy something, I find out that somebody in the church already has it. So we have budget for Vacation Bible School. We'll buy anything that we need to, but you might already have some of these things at your house that we could borrow, and then we don't have to store them. So... We are looking for a small play tent, not a necessarily a camping tent, just a small, more of a medieval style, something we can make look medieval. Um, sand table and toys, a kid's puppet station, the kid's size one, the Newton's cradle, those are the things with the balls that you pull and they swing back and forth. Maybe you already have one sitting on your desk and don't mind letting us use it for our science lessons. 
herald trumpets, plastic ones, the toy kinds like you would use at a sporting event. Sometimes people have those. Yeah. Um, Nerf or suction cut bows and arrows. You following a theme here? Medieval? Toy armor, medieval costumes, pool noodles. We do all kinds of fun things with pool noodles. Um, and then we will decorate the building with plastic tablecloths will look like curtains. As you put them on the walls and you gather them in the middle, it looks like you're in a castle. So we're looking for purple and green of those. And then those triangle pendants, you know what I'm talking about? You buy them at the dollar store. It, some people have boxes sitting around, leftovers from parties. So I ask before we buy them. And then to build the um, castle on the float, we need large court cardboard boxes that we will use sponges to paint bricks onto. So if you have a large cardboard box from an appliance or something else that you ordered from Ikea or Amazon or whatever, don't put it in the recyclable Bring it here and we Keith will use it. Keith does amazing things with cardboard boxes. <laughs> and the rest of us will make them, I'm sorry? the rest of us will take the sponges and stamp them. You feel them. old already? Okay. Okay. <laughs> if you have questions about any of those things, like I said, that list will also be in GroupMe. Um, you can see me or see Liz or Anna, you know, anybody who's doing the decorating and we will be happy to put your stuff to work, <laughs> to so use. If you caught... I'll leave that up there. You'll also see this on your group me. Um, so you're welcome to take a picture. But uh, if you caught what Susan said, there is a church that it, that it, we're connected with. The, the two pastors are dear friends of mine. I went to college with them in Ohio that's having this VBS this week. And they would have shared their other decorations with us, but it's going to another church that's doing it the same week we are. So we can't both have it. Um, but they said they don't want all of our costumes, so you can have the costumes. So end of the week, they're boxing the costumes up and sending them all to us. Isn't that wonderful? Yeah. So Camden Baptist Church of Wellington, Ohio, which was just less than a half an hour from where she grew up, Susan grew up, and a wonderful friend church that's friends of ours uh, is doing that for us. So that's a huge praise. I don't know um, sizes and what they're going to look like yet, but within about a week and a half, we'll I think have the ideas. way Pastor Larry indicated, they're adult. Yeah. So adult sizes. Well, yeah, but there's so a wide range. We stuff. will. <laughs> well, yeah, I mean, yes. Um, but we will have some options for you. Another praise, if you had not heard, um, our house went on the market last Thursday, and by Wednesday. We had accepted a counteroffer. We counteroffered several times with a, a young couple. We we're very happy with um, who has bought it. It's not an investor. It's not going to be a rental. It's somebody that's going to love the house. And that means a lot to us. Uh, we did get more than we asked for. And you can look up on Zillow how much we asked for. And pretty soon you'll be able to look up how much we got. So it's not, none of it's a secret. All right. That's, today you can find all those things out. I can find that out about your house and you can do it about mine. That's just how life works today, right? It's all public information. Um, so we're really praising the Lord. That will close July 6th. Janae, Janae moves on July 5th. The house closes on the 6th. God's God is timing. so good. Yeah. All the time. Amen? Amen. <clears throat> I don't have Bev here anymore, so somebody has to tell. God is good all the time. All the time. God is good. Thank you. Very good. Very good. <laughs> well, you just shout it out, Jacob. Don't worry about others. They'll follow. Please watch your group me this week. We are quite possibly going to be having a baptism service next Sunday after church. It is Father's Day. Um, with that, I would like to do a potluck slash barbecue, and it's all going to happen at the house I just sold. <laughs> Isn't that great? Because we'll, be we'll use that swimming pool uh, for one last time. Uh, after that, we're going to have to drive to Antique and go to Miss Julia's. <laughs> Julia has hosted a lot of baptisms houses and we are we're thankful that if we needed it she's willing um cindy calderon had her second ablation surgery this week it was fully successful as far as the surgery is 
concerned that it'll take them up to three months to know if it worked. But they were able to finish, which they weren't last time. Praise God. Um, keep praying for Cindy. So um, there's some needs with the Malkinroths, um, some insurance things with the kids and so forth. Is that all resolved or still still working on? Okay, so be praying about that. Um, we can tell you more about that another time. <laughs> and uh, Lord willing, this young man in the front row is going to come live permanently in, in within a couple weeks, right? <laughs> Lord willing. So, yeah, talking about you. <laughs> so pray for Sebastian as well. And uh, it seems like there should be a few other things to be praying about, but would you please mark your calendar, mark daily, every morning, every evening, whatever, whenever you go to the Lord in your time of prayer, be praying for VBS. Um, we are now starting to see registrations come in from our boost post. Uh, if you're on Facebook, Grab that post from the church page and share it. It will help us get the word out there. Um, we have the sign out front um, already. We will be having um, postcards of some sort made up for the parade that will have the QR code for registration. If your kids are coming and they're not registered yet, get on there and register, okay? We, we want your registrations coming in so that we can make plans appropriately. All right. God is so good, and we are just so thankful uh, for his work, how he works in our lives. We're thankful for safety, uh, for our family as we traveled, and um, there's so much more. It's good to have Keith's parents with us again. Always good to have you guys. Um, I, I, I want to shout out to Keith and his dad because they've been working on my Buick, which we've used in parades and different things in the past, and it's running again. And that was a, a, just a huge load off my mind to get that taken care of. So, again, Keith, thank you. 1969. You'll see it. You'll see we'll it. take you for a ride. It's in. almost as old as I am, okay, Sebastian? <laughs> Say, that's old. I'll take it up with you later. <laughs> it is. <sighs> we know. Let's look to the Lord. Let's look to the Lord in prayer. I got a challenge one on, one on my hands. Oh, Father, you are so good to us. Father, we just want to praise you. Uh, we want to praise you for how you're working in lives. We want to praise you for the good trip that Susan and I and my parents had last weekend. We want to praise you for bringing the right person to connect with to buy the house. I want to praise you for Cindy's successful surgery and pray that, Father, it does what it was intended to do and that she will not have the issues that she's been facing. Father, we do lay needs before you. We think of the McEnroths and the, the insurance needs with the grandkids and the final paperwork and everything for Sebastian. And we're thankful they can be here this morning and ask for your grace in their lives for your blessing upon them. Father, we thank you. We praise you for the generosity of the church in Ohio to share with us what you provided for them, uh, that we could use it for your glory here. And Father, we do pray as we prepare and pray for, for Vacation Bible School that you would bring in those children that you would have to hear the gospel. And Father, we might be used by you to lead little ones to Christ. And we're going to thank you for what you do. Now, as we worship you this morning, we just want to glorify you in all that we say. In Jesus' name, amen. <clears throat>
because of anything we have done, not because of who we are, but because who He is. Grace is not grace if we earn it. Grace is not grace if we deserve it. The writer of this great old hymn was a slave trader, slave ship captain, technically. And God got a hold of his heart. And that's why it says, saved a wretch like me. We need a proper understanding of ourselves that we're a wretch. We're at enmity with God. We're enemies. And we do have nothing to offer. But Christ, in His death on the cross, offers us hope. Stand with me. Let's sing this old hymn. Amazing grace, how sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. But now I see Twice grace at all 
God's people said, Amen. Amen. Children, get to be with Jacob and Talitha today. So much fun. Sebastian, you are not a child. <laughs> I want to take a few minutes to just review. It is so clear that God intervenes in our plans so often. We have things planned out for weeks, months, years in advance. And something happens that changes everything. Often, I've been reminded that you can't steer a moving car. Keith was... You can't steer a, a car that isn't moving. You can't steer a car that isn't moving. Keith was commenting on the power steering in my old Buick. It's a lot different than modern power steering. All you have to do is have one little finger and it'll just go easy as can be. But that car still won't change directions unless the tires are rotating. And it's moving forward or backwards. See, God says a man plans his way, but God determines his path. You have, to, you have to already be moving. You have to be planning. You have to be doing for God to give you the nudge to go this way or that way. We have saw in the book of Acts, starting in, at the end of chapter 14, I'm sorry, the end of chapter 15, uh, that Paul had plans made to go back to the, to the churches he had planted on his first trip. Paul, got, uh, Paul's plan was to take the same people, go to the same places, but God had other plans. God's plan was a new team. Paul and Silas was new places, skip Cyprus, go overland through Syria and Sicilia. And I, I just remind you of that that uh, path uh, follows the overland from Antioch up through Tarsus because he came from Jerusalem up. And we have found Paul going through some of the same cities and then got stuck. God gave, God gave him a new helper, um, Timothy. God, God gave him a new direction. He would not let him go south, not get, let him go north. Instead, he gave him a dream in which a man from Macedonia said, come over and help us. And so God called him to cross the straits into Macedonia, which is part of modern day Greece. Um, and Paul and Silas, you're warm. Would you push the down arrow on the side of that thing two times? Maybe three times. Is it not... Is it not Hmm. Let's see. Let's fix it. Make sure it's sit on, on cool, first of all. It's off. There we go. Somebody turned it off. I didn't do that. It, we find the, the pronoun changed from they to we, which means Dr. Luke had joined them. Dr. Luke went with them. They went over to evangelize. God gave them new disciples in Philippi. Gave them Lydia. And then the jailer and his family. And I'm not going to go back through that story. But one of the, one of the greatest places to go to talk, to the, talk about the, the uh, gospel. The jailer says, what must I do to be saved? And the answer was so simple that sometimes people cannot comprehend that that's all. It wasn't do these things, say these prayers, 
get baptized and do this and do that and do the other thing. It was simply one word, believe. The idea of faith. Believe on the Lord Jesus and you will be saved. What about the Lord Jesus? We have to believe on who he is and what he did, right? He is God the Son who came and died on the cross for your sins and mine. From Philippi, they continued their journeys, and that's where we're going to pick it up today. Uh, we're, the message titled today is Preaching the Word of God. And first, we find the Word of God resisted at Thessalonica. Verse 1 of chapter 17 of the book of Acts, if you want to get your Bibles open uh, and follow along. Then they traveled through Amphibia, Am, Am, Amphipolis, I can't, A-M-P-H-I-P-O-L-I-S. And Amphipolis, and Apollonia, and came to Thessalonica. I'm going to give Samantha a minute. They're up there on the screen. Apparently there was no synagogues at these two cities. And Thessalonica was a strategic center. There was a Jewish synagogue in Thessalonica, which remember required at least 10 adult men to start a synagogue. That was the rules. Paul went into the synagogue and I want to give you some words. He spent three weeks in the synagogue. Notice what it says. Reasoned with him the scriptures had to suffer and rise from the dead. Then Jesus, this Jesus I'm proclaiming to you is the Messiah. Three Sabbath days. There it is. It's verse 2. I, I can't even see. Verse 2, it says he was there for three Sabbath days. That's three Saturdays. So that's three weeks. He's in the city, reasoning with them. He is talking with them. And I want you to notice, um, during that time, Philippians 4.15 says this. You Philippians know that in the early days of the gospel, remember he was just at Philippi. He's now at Thessalonica. He's talking about that trip at Thessalonica as he's writing back to the Philippians. When I left Macedonia, no church shared with me in the matter of giving and receiving except you and lo you alone. For even in Thessalonica, you sent gifts for my needs several times. He was there long enough in Thessalonica that the church he had just planted in, Philipp in Philippi was sending gifts already. How quickly these new believers saw the need to support what Paul was doing. Paul did tent making while he was there. And in verse 2 and 3, there are four key words that are used. First of all, he reasoned with them. Verse 2, three Sabbath days, reasoned with them from the scriptures. The concept of reasoning is to dial, have dialogue by question and answer. It's a great first step whenever talking to anybody about Christ. Ask questions. Let them answer. Let them ask questions. And you answer. And you have a dialogue back and forth. Jesus used question and answers often in talking with people. It's reasoning together. You know, somehow in our culture today, it seems like we can't have dialogue about religion or politics, two things that we need to have good dialogue about. We need to be able to talk to each other about what we think about politics. And we need to be gracious, compassionate. We need to be understanding that people are not all going to think alike, amen? Including within the church. This is not a political place, but we can have reasonable conversations. But my 
my goodness, we need to have conversations about religions. And my friends, the religions around here want to have conversations about their religions. We had the opportunity on the plane from Phoenix to Columbus. We sat by a man who, for the first hour, had his hoodie up and his earphones in and was kind of hiding in the window like, I don't want to talk to anybody. You've been on planes with people like that? And then some, someday, Sebastian, someday. Then Susan got a drink and said something about, I'm sorry if I spilled this on you. And the hood came off and the mask came off and the earphones came out and we began to talk. And he was from Pakistan. He was a unique, uh, uh, an unusual sect of Muslim that I hadn't heard of before who was persecuted in Pakistan. So they come to the United States on... Um, Asylum visas. And he began to open up and ask and talk to us. We asked questions. He, we were having a dialogue, this back and forth. Before we ended, we recommended that he read the book by Qureshi, Seeking Islam, finding, Seeking Allah, Finding Jesus. If you haven't read that book, I highly recommend it. Even if, j just to have, be able to have interaction with Muslims. As we walked through the airport, he was ahead of us, about to go down the escalator. He stopped, turned around, and caught my attention and waved. I'm like, something connected. Got home, and there was an email from him. Because I'd given him my card. Pray that God might use that interaction that started with reasoning together, dialogue. We offered one thing that he was looking for an understanding of who he is and where he's come from. We did not shut him down. We did not condemn Islam. The Bible will take care of that in its own time. What we need to do is the things Paul's doing here, and we're going to get to some more of that. And looking at the clock, we may not get to the one I'm really wanting to get to until next week. That's okay. Secondly, he explained. Verse Three, explaining and showing that the Messiah had to suffer and rise from the dead. He explained. To explain something which has been previously hidden or obscured. To unveil. You know, there's times when I need a lot explained to me because I'm pretty dense. There's other times when I'm learning something brand new. Are we still learning? At, you know, I don't care if you're in here and you're 13. 13? 13? Or 55, or I won't name a few others. Dan, how old are you? 76. 76? I will not ask his wife. That is impolite. <laughs> She's much younger, I'm sure. So is my wife. That's why my car is the old lady. If you ever hear me talk about my old lady, whether you're listening to me on Facebook or in here, it's not Susan. I call my old, the car my old lady because she is a lady because she wears skirts and she's older than, than Susan is. I would never call my wife that. That is so disrespectful. He proved. To prove is to give or to provide reasoning for by placing something in front of a person to give evidence for. He proved, notice what he said, showing that the Messiah, explaining and showing or proving that the Messiah had to suffer and rise from the dead. And finally, he announced or he proclaimed, explaining and showing that the Messiah had to suffer and rise from the dead. This Jesus I am proclaiming to you is the Messiah. Is the Messiah. He is talking to the Jewish people that have a foundation of understanding the, who the Messiah was supposed to be, that the Messiah was coming. They already tr believed in Jehovah God, right? By the way, you, you have somebody that says they believe in God, that does not make them saved. What did the Philippian jailer have to do? Believe on Jesus Christ. A generic belief in God, a lot of people have, the demons have in tremble, Right? Well, Paul's 
Paul's testimony was given to those people. Paul had great triumph there. Notice what it says in verse 4. Then some of them were persuaded and joined Paul and Silas, including a great number of God-fearing Greeks, as well as a number of the leading women. There were people that responded to the gospel. They trusted Christ Jesus as their Lord and Savior. Great number of them. But Paul also had tribulation here. <clears throat> Verse 5, a riot is brought to the city, but the Jews became jealous. They brought together some scoundrels from the marketplace. Sounds like some of the political riots that we've heard about in the United States recently, some of them have been proven to have some scoundrels in them, right? Yeah. You got people come bringing other people in to hype up the crowd. They formed a mob and started rioting in the city and they attacked Jason's house. Now Jason was the person that had, brought, that had welcomed Paul into his home in Thessalonica, had taken care of Paul. They came to Jason's house. They arrested Jason and other brothers, took them down to the magistrates, accused them of inciting riot and notice what it says these men verse uh we're in verse six part way through these men who have turned the world upside down have come here too and jason has received them as guests they are all acting contrary to caesar's decree declaring or saying that there is another king another of a different kind another king who is jesus the jews stirred up the crowd and the city officials heard these things so taking a security bond from jason and the others they released him Security bond for what? That Paul would leave town and not come back. Okay? That's what Jason was promising Paul would move on. Paul would leave. Jason had to pay money to do that. Paul was snuck away by the brothers. Verse 10. As soon as it was night, the brothers sent Paul and Silas off to Berea. Berea is a very important, maybe some of you have heard of churches named Berea Baptist Church sometimes. Berea is a very important city, but a very, very small section in the book of Acts. And we don't have a um, book written to the Bereans, do we? We have the Philippians, we have the Thessalonians, we have the Corinthians, but not the Bereans. But why is it important? I want to look at a few things about Berea. The word received and researched. So in Thessalonica, the word is resisted by the Jews. In Berea, the word is received and then researched. So Paul again goes to the synagogue. As soon as he arrives, he goes to the synagogue. The people were more open-minded than those in Thessalonica. People were willing to think about and receive what Paul had to say. They welcomed the message with eagerness and examined daily to see if these things are so. You should never, let me make this very strong, you should never take what a preacher says at face value. If he's not showing it from the word of God, and if you can't, st don't study it out yourself to show that he's preaching the correct things, that's on you and you shouldn't, you, you it's not what you should be doing. You should be Bereans. You should be examining the Word of God. Everything I teach, everything I preach, should be from the Word of God. It should not be from my mind or my opinions. However, let me put a little caveat to that. There are times when I will say, I think this might have happened, or I think that it might be true. The Scripture doesn't tell us, but maybe it happened this way. I always tell you, if what I'm saying is not coming directly from Scripture. And if you catch me ever not doing that, you should call me on it. And if you don't think you can talk to me directly about that, talk to Tom, talk to Sonny. They'll call me on it, right? Because what I say needs to come from the Word of God if I'm preaching. I think it's v we can say very clearly what Paul did in Berea, was preaching the word of God. Now, why was it so important to the Bereans? I want you to remember what they didn't have. They didn't have the New Testament. 
They didn't have any of the books from Matthew to Revelation. All they had was the Old Testament. So what scriptures were they searching? The Old Testament. Because the Old Testament is revealed in the New Testament. So if you search the Old Testament, you will find the Messiah. You will find Isaiah 53, the death of Christ. You will find all of these things that we see clearly now in the New Testament revealed in the Old Testament. You will find who God is. You will find his plan of salvation in the Old Testament. We have it revealed in the New Testament. Well, doesn't take Satan long, does it? Satan will attack wherever God is working. And we have to have what on? Our armor on, right? We have to be ready because the attacks will come. And if we're not ready, they'll be successful in making us, remember what the armor's for? So we don't move backwards. They'll cause us to, Satan can cause us to retreat if we're not ready with the armor. Well, Satan did come. Verse 12, consequently many of them believed, including a number of the prominent Greek women, as well as the men. But when the Jews at Thessalonica, not very far away, heard the news, somebody telegraphed or picked up the telephone and called Thessalonica. No, it didn't work that way. Somebody had to travel, right? But the Roman roads, people were traveling. The stories were told. The news got back to Thessalonica that God's message was being proclaimed in Berea by Paul. And they were angry. I thought we put a stop to this dude. Satan agitated them. They came to Berea and agitated the crowds. Verse 14, the brothers immediately sent Paul away to go by sea. But I want you to notice this. Silas and Timothy stayed on. Why would Silas and Timothy have stayed on at Berea? Because there was a lot more teaching that needed to happen. Remember what they didn't have. They didn't have the New Testament. I know I, I sound like a broken record. You know, somebody can learn a lot just by reading the New Testament. And they can, they can get a lot out of it. If you don't even have the New Testament, you need somebody to stay and teach you. They only had verbal communication at that point of what the Word of God said and the Old Testament. And so... Timothy and Silas stayed behind and were investing time and energy with these new believers who have found Christ, but they're babies. There's a baby in the back. What's that baby got in its mouth? A bottle of milk. Milk is an elemental food resource. It's the basics. As that baby grows up, it's going to be getting more and more solid food, which mom and dads are ha thankful for because it can stretch out feeding times, right? And eventually it can handle things like meat, potatoes, right? Good, good food or ceviche, right? I don't know any Croatian dishes or I'll, I'd say one. Lumpia! Yeah, you, you, you wouldn't want to feed that baby lumpia right now, would you? No, of course not. No. So what was Silas and Timothy doing? Feeding the milk of the word, the very basic principles. We have to start with the basics and to, to, as believers. And, and we can have baby believers that are five or six years old, 50, 60 years old, 70, 80, 90 years old. They're still babies. They still need milk. And to, they need to progress. We don't abandon the babies, do we? Right. That's called discipleship. We have to stay and work. Sorry. Paul's sent on to Athens from Berea, the... the, the Opposition comes quick from Satan. So he goes with a few of his handlers 
from Berea and moves on to Athens. And Athens does not have a synagogue. I'm sorry, Athens does has a, have a synagogue, but Athens is a center of pagan worship in the Roman world in that day. Athens was a center of learning, knowledge, of sharing that knowledge. So Paul goes first into the synagogue. He reasoned, verse 17, in the synagogue with the Jews that worship God and in the marketplace every day. He was standing in the marketplace. He was meeting people. He met the Jews in the in the synagogue and the Gentile worshipers there. And then he goes into the marketplace and he meets with the people where they're at, at their crossroads, if you will. Daily. The city was full of idols, says verse 16. Full of idols. Everywhere you turned, it was idol worship. You know, we don't, aren't faced with that near as much today in the U.S. as in other countries. But I want you to, I want to tell you, just because there's there's not idols in people's houses of, of gold and stone and wood, and some do. Trust me, there's our neighborhood's full of it. The Hindi are idol worshippers, all right? But even if there weren't, there's still lots of idols. And all you have to do is read gospel trees and to know that Christians have idols too. In fact, there's a lot of warning in Scripture against idols, but the city was full. So he reasoned in the synagogue. He reasoned in the marketplace. And he reasoned with two different kinds of people, two types of Athenians. First of all, he reasoned with the Epicureans. They believed that truth was through experience, not through reasoning. They were materialists. Believed in the, the stuff that you have to prove the things. They were atheists. And their goal in life was pleasure in this body. He also reasoned with another kind. Oh, that didn't come in right, but that's all right. The Stoics. The Stoics believed there was one God over everything, but they were polytheists. They believed that God is the different forces of nature and they worshipped all gods. Sounds a little bit contradictory, but they believed there was one big God and then there was lots of little gods. Let's just put it that way, okay? They believed in personal, dis personal discipline and self-control. They believed the body was evil. Pleasure was bad. They believed that pain was not evil. They believed in following reason that inner feelings or outward circumstances should not be what drives them. Reason should drive them. Very different sets of people. The Stoics and the Epicureans. Two very different re responses from these people. Notice in, in verse, ten, verse 18, then also came some of the Epicureans, Stoic philosophers, philosophers and argued with him some said what is this pseudo intellectual trying to say or another translation says babbler babbler pseudo intellectual literally means seed picker one who picks up scraps it's an insult they ridiculed paul and his idea of a resurrection of a Messiah of one God. Then there was another group that were confused but interested. Verse, uh, continuing in verse 18. Others replied, he seems to be a preacher of foreign dignity deities because he was telling the good news about Jesus and the resurrection. Not quite getting it, but uh, there's some interest here. So they took him and brought him to the Aragopias, or the Mars Hill. 
saying, may we learn about this new teaching you're speaking of. Hey, I want, I'm interested. Not interested in knowing Jesus Christ. They're just interested in always learning something new. They want to know what's going on. For what you say sounds strange to us, and we want to know what these ideas mean. Now the Athenians, Luke, Luke's commentary in here, Athenians made all the foreign residents there spend their time t- telling nothing else but telling or hearing something new. That's what they wanted to do. So Paul, Paul is brought to the Areopagus or Mars Hill. The council there watched over all religion in the city and they watched over all education in the city. So anything that's being taught, anything that's being worshipped, comes before the council at Mars Hill. I'm going to say Mars Hill because it's a lot easier than saying the other word for it. Okay. This was not a formal trial. It was an informal meeting because they wanted to, to know. So Paul's speech, one of the most famous in the book of Acts, Paul's sermon here, and I'm not going to go into all the details, but he starts by saying this, Men of Athens, I see that you are extremely religious in every respect. You're very religious. Religious does not equal saved. Amen? Lots of people are religious. That doesn't mean they know Jesus Christ. These people in Athens were extremely religious. They had lots of idols. Notice what he says as he continues, I, uh, for I was passing through and observing the objects of your worship, I even found an altar on which was inscribed to an unknown God. You even worship what you don't know. Just in case. Just in case we missed one. We don't want to offend that one God, so we'll worship him too. We have no idea how he wants to be worshipped, who he is, what he does, but we'll worship him just in case. Aren't you glad we don't have to do that? Aren't you glad we can know the one true God? Therefore, what you worship in ignorance, I proclaim to you. Now, here is quickly the bullet points of Paul's sermon. First of all, he talks about the greatness of God. God is creator. The God, verse 24, who made the world and everything in it, He is Lord of heaven and earth and does not live in shrines made by man. Our God is alive. He's not a statue. He's not an idol. He doesn't live in houses made by man because he is spirit, not physical. God is great. Secondly, the goodness of God. Verse 25. Neither is he served by human hands as though he needed anything since he himself gives everyone life and breath and all things. First of all, God does not need. If anybody ever tells you that God created man because he needed something, your red flag should go up and say, wait a second, God can't be God and need anything. Right? He he can't need because he's God. Instead, God is the provider of all things. Notice what he says he provides. Life, breath, all things, everything you have, everything you are, the very air you breathe, is given to you by God. Is he therefore worthy of our worship? Is he therefore worthy of our devotion? Yeah. Second, thirdly, the government of God. He is the ruler, verse 26, for one, for one man... From, from one man is made every nationality to live over the whole earth and determine their appointed times and boundaries where to live. God is in control of who you are, where you were born, where you live, where you're going to die. He did this so they might seek God, perhaps might reach out and find him, though he's not far from each one of us. For in him we all live and move and exist as even if some of your poets have said, for we are also his offspring. 
being God's offspring, we shouldn't think that the divine nature is like gold or silver or stone, an image fashioned by human art and imagination. God's in control. We can't boil him down to a gold statue. He's the one that made you who you are, that put you where you are, <laughs> even moved you from foreign countries to where you are now. Why? So that, we, that they might seek God, reach out and find him. Well, what will you find? The grace of God. Verse 30 and 31. Therefore, having overlooked at the times of ignorance, God now commands all people everywhere to repent. God's grace extended, overlooked ignorance. But now you're held accountable. Everyone, everywhere is to repent because he has set a day when he is going to judge the world in righteousness by a man he has appointed and provided proof of this to everyone by raising him from the dead. He commands all to repent. He's going to judge by Christ because he's the one that's worthy of judgment because he's been raised from the dead. Well, how did the, the crowd there in Athens respond? They mocked. When they heard about the resurrection of the dead, some began to riddle him, ridicule him. Remember, half of this crowd thinks the body's bad and we shouldn't, as soon as we can get out of the body, the better, and we certainly don't want to go back into it. Resurrection. Why would we want that? Being a spirit is free. We want that because that's how God made us. And when he comes back, our bodies will be perfect. Not broken. Dan and I were commiserating about getting older. You know, some of us have dealt with more issues than others. In that day, Dino's spine will be straight. Tom's legs will work. Joyce's ears will work. Amen? Because all will be made right. My hips won't hurt anymore. If you didn't know, I have arthritis in my hips. No big deal. Well, well you, everyone has pain, don't we? Of some sort. All of us have something that bothers us. Talitha went to cardiologist this week because her heart rate's doing some funny things. She can be praying for Talitha. Nothing major. No, not serious. Still trying to figure it out. Why? Because of sin's curse, we're, our bodies are not perfect. We deal with high blood pressure and diabetes, cancer, and everything else. They mocked. Sooner out of this body, the better, but not, not so with Christians. But that's not all. However, verse 34, however, some men joined and believed, including Diocenes, the Areopagite, one of those council of the Aragopias. Uh, uh, can't say it right. Marcel. The woman named Demetrius and others with them. There were people there that were listening to Paul that heard him speak of the creator, which is the foundational thing. When somebody doesn't have that foundation, you've got to lay it. Jesus Christ, Ephesians says, he is the creator. First uh, John 1 says, he made all things. Only God can be the creator. Jesus Christ, the second person of the Godhead, the Son of God, cannot be part of the creation and make creation. The logic of that is infallible. Nor can he make time and be bound by time. So God is outside of time. But Jesus entered into time by taking on the body of a human being so that he could die for us human beings. And he rose again, ensuring our resurrection and our life with him for eternity in heaven because our sins have been paid for. He paid our price. The wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life. 
through Jesus Christ our Lord. So, what will your response be? Is, have you already responded to the gospel? Are you serving? Are you being bold like Paul? Is your armor on? Because Satan's going to attack the more bold you are. Or are we hiding in a corner? Start having those gospel conversations. Start having those God conversations. Ask questions. Just start by asking, what's your faith? Do you have a faith background? What do you believe about God? What, what does your religion say about Jesus Christ? This man on the plane believed Jesus was a prophet, but they had their own Messiah, which most Muslims don't agree with. Really was interesting. Pray with me. Father God, we thank you for your word. Thank you for the truth that we find in it. And Father, may we be like the Bereans and dig in and prove that these things be true. That Jesus did come in the flesh. That he was crucified for our sins. Buried and three days later risen from the dead so that we might have the sure thing of resurrection, the hope of resurrection that is coming yet future. For ourselves and for our loved ones that have faith in Jesus Christ. Thank you for that. In Jesus' name, amen. Stand with me and let's sing together by faith.
mountain shall be moved And the power of the gospel shall prevail For we know in Christ all things are possible For all who call that by His name We will stand as children of the promise we will fix our eyes on him, our souls we will Till the race is finished and the work is done We'll walk by faith and not by sight We will stand as children of the promise We will fix our eyes on him, our souls Till the race is finished and the work is done We'll walk by faith and not by sight We'll walk by faith and not by sight Assemble and worship you, O oh Lord. Thank you for your word that has been preached, O oh Lord, and and help us, O oh Lord, to walk in this word, O oh Lord, um, obeying your words, preaching your word, O oh Lord, to all people. Thank you, Lord. Bless your people, O oh Lord. In Jesus' name, we pray. Amen. <laughs>